There we go, an assortment of long-lived vermin for your delectation. If you look here, the light blue lines are the survival lines of cohorts of ordinary animals. The red and yellow lines are the survival curves of organisms with single gene mutations in them. In Canarabditis elegans, soil living roundworm, Drosophila, and mice. And as you can see, some of these increases in lifespan are quite large. And they are increases in healthy lifespan, which is quite reassuring. So, what does this tell us, really? Well, the mechanisms that extend lifespan in these different species appear to be common. But we run right up against this whole problem of differential usage. When you look and do comparative genomics on these species, the process is conserved, but very few of the actual genes are. And this is roughly along the lines of, I can't think of a good analogy, but the best one I can think of would be a watch. A watch, the processes in a watch involve telling the time. If you think about the variety of watches you can get, there can be conservation of parts, but there doesn't have to be. You can have clockwork watches, digital watches, and a variety of different designs. There are some common strands through running through the processes, and they form the beginnings of a very exciting new conceptual understanding of how aging happens that I'm going to talk about. Okay, why bother understanding this? Well, <coughs> aging, as I think everybody is aware of, is fairly is a worldwide problem. The percentages of the population that are estimated to be over the age of 60 by the middle of this century are variable but large, and a large population of older people at the moment also means a large, potentially a large population of unhealthy older people. And I'll spend a couple of minutes, I don't normally bother, but I will spend a couple of minutes to talk about this. If we look at what a biological gerontologist would, be, would consider to be aging well, which is aging with marginal physiological decline, and reasonable social engagement. Okay. And the two processes are linked. If you, don't, if you don't think health and social engagement are linked, go up to a friend and kick them very hard in the kneecap, and then invite them to come out jogging with you. Okay. And they will decline. If we use those two markers, only about 18% of the current population is aging. If you are slightly, I'll choose my words with care, earlier, Okay, you can, in bring, you can do something with aging that you don't seem to do with syphilis, which is you can bring in as a parameter how people feel about having aging, for want of a better word, you know. And you can say that as long as you're happy with it, well, that's good. And when you do that, when you bring in a more psychosocial element to assessment of health, you get higher overall success rates, about 50 to 70 percent of people when they're asked to celebrate if they're aging well, will record those kinds of scores. And that tells you sort of two things. The first one is, the unsurprising one, that it is possible to be happy even if you have some morbidity. Okay? Just because you have a toothache doesn't mean you can't laugh at a joke. However, about anywhere between 50% and 25% of the population are not giggling at all. They are not happy and they are not healthy either, and that is just really not acceptable. We need to be in a better place than this. It's my little why we're in the actual speech. Okay, so this is what we understand about aging. This summarizes all of the work since about 1960 onwards on one slide. Okay, what you can think of is the um, going back to the sort of evolutionary biology arguments I made earlier, you can think of lineage-specific or private mechanisms of aging, and you can think of more general or public mechanisms of aging, and there are a few sort of ones that fall in the middle. The classic private or lineage-specific mechanism of aging would be that you see in female Drosophila. A major cause of aging in female Drosophila is the toxic effect of male Drosophila sperm. This is not generally considered to be a good candidate for a human aging mechanism. Okay. Canarabditis elegans is another good example. What happens in C. elegans aging is that the animal has an acute cuticle. It's laid down fractionally faster than it's 
worn away because the thing pushes through the soil. This is great in the early part of the lifespan. However, what happens is the cuticle gets thicker and thicker, the animal has increasing difficulty moving, and eventually it tears blocks of muscle and can no longer move. That's pretty cuticle restricted. Okay? And on the other hand, you have more general mechanisms. The, the best known general mechanism is the idea that oxidative damage contributes or plays a primary role in setting lifespan. But I've put that up, and it is becoming increasingly unsatisfactory as a mechanism of aging. Okay? The two I'll really talk about predominantly are the intranigiate axis and alterations in energy balance. I'll also talk a little bit about replicative senescence, which is sort of semi-private. Um, because it's found in a restricted set of animals, including us. So, what ties all this together? This is a very, very simplified diagram of something called the broad spectrum detoxification hypothesis of aging, or is it sometimes called the green theory? And the originator of this is David James of University College, and I think it's the best conceptual breakthrough that has been made for a while. Basically, it comes out of looking at the genes that go up and down in organisms which undergo extended lifespan, the extended lifespan mutants, and looking at what those genes are used for rather than what those genes actually look like at the DNA sequence level. And basically, a lot of those genes specify broad spectrum detoxification and recycling pathways. So how long you live as an organism is a function of how efficiently the organism recycles lipophilic xenobiotics, toxins, or junk, and how effectively it can recycle proteins which have been damaged with, as a result of the action of those kinds of agents. Okay? So if you think about it here, you have multiple sources of damage coming in of which oxidative damage is one feedstock going into this pile of junk. Okay? The IIS mutants and something called calorie restriction, which I'll talk a little bit about later, probably work by upregulating repair processes. All right? And that would, I think, be a reasonable summary of my conceptual understanding at the moment. It has some very good features as a scientific hypothesis. It explains a lot of data, including some data which I confess was difficult to square with earlier hypotheses, particularly with oxidative stress, but also with things like advanced glycation end products. If you stop them happening, why didn't the organism notice? Okay. Um, and it provides some very exciting possibilities for new experiments that will sort of deepen our understanding of where we are. Okay. I've alluded to calorie restriction, and this is it in a nutshell. Dietary or calorie restriction is the observation that if you take an organism and put it on a diet that's complete in all regards, but rather deficient in calories, you see a dramatic extension in lifespan, and it's really big. Okay? And it's very, very common. You can see this happen in Daphnia, you can see it happen in flies, okay, I think you can see it happen in spiders, speaking at the top of my head. And in mammals like the mouse, this extra hit on lifespan, this extra increase in lifespan, is predominantly through tumor production. Okay? That seems to be quite clear. So, is in fact, can you in fact diet your way to a significant increase in lifespan? And if so, how? Yes and no is the short answer. What calorie restriction seems to do is it seems to place a premium on recycling. And that makes sense. You have limited inflow of energy, so you scavenge what you can from calorie restriction pathways. And things like phase 2 detoxification systems are up in these organisms. And there's 